Welcome to another Quantum Conversation, brought to you by AcousticHealth.com. I'm Loren Gailey, and I invite you to sit back as we enter the Quantum Realm, that space of the greater part of you. It is your connection to infinite possibilities, infinite potential, and infinite mastery. Welcome, everyone. Part of our mastery that we have in the quantum realm is unlocking our spiritual and our psychic abilities. So today we are here with a fascinating speaker, the author of 11 books on this topic and others, and also the executive director of the Ethereum Society in the UK. Richard Lawrence is here with us and we're talking about unlocking your psychic and spiritual powers. Hello, Richard. Welcome. Hi, Lauren. Delighted to be on your on your conversation. Delighted to have you here. You are quite esteemed in the work that you do for the past 40 years. At least you've been dealing with this topic and you are really you've been mentored by Dr. George King. Let's start with your background. What led you on this path? What happened in your own awakening that led you to write 11 books on these topics? <laughs> well, I, I wasn't you know, really intent on writing books when I had my <laughs> awakening, as you, as you rightly call it. What happened to me? I mean, look, I hear so many stories and, and sometimes people have found their path through difficult events in their life. Um, of one kind, be it health, be it a mental difficulty, be it uh, an emotional difficulty. And it's then they found through that, they told me anyway, uh, that they found what they were really meant to be doing in life. But I must say in my case, uh, it didn't happen that way. I had a wonderful childhood. I had wonderful family. I had great educational opportunities. There was no kind of real shortage of money. I can't complain. And I had plenty of friends and lots to do. So I can't complain at all. But I, I just remember, and I don't complain. They were all wonderful. But I just woke up one morning, age 14, and suddenly asked the question, what's the point of life? I'm sure others have done this uh, in, at all ages. The day before, it didn't bother me. But suddenly it did bother me. What is the point of that life? Because this has got to be more to it than this. This is all good, but it's got to be more. And cutting a long story short, I thought people would know. I, I mean, in, you know, I was raised in the Anglican Church, a British Christian church, and I thought that the priest would know. I, I went to a school which uh, is the sort of the head of the church, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, who actually confirmed me in, into the Christian religion. And I had access to the dean and who was, the, you know, like his number two. So I thought they'd know the answers to these. I thought it might be fairly plain sailing. And it wasn't. Uh, they didn't, to my satisfaction anyway, know the answers that I was to the questions I was asking. And the thing that troubled me more than that, actually, was that it didn't seem that they really cared that much. Mm -hmm. And I found that with uh, quite a few adults that I came across. Um, it certainly concerned my parents a bit. They kind of didn't understand why it mattered so much to me. They, they're really good people, my parents. What but did they, like the clergy, what did they say was the point of life? Well, I mean, I, I had three main questions which I wanted answering. Uh, two of them were very similar. They were, if Jesus is the one and only uh, way, the way, the truth, and the life, as many still say. I don't want to, you know, I respect all religions, so I'm not sort of criticizing anyone else's faith. But to me, I, I had two questions about that. One, what happened to the people born before Jesus? What was the point of their life? Why were they not given the one and only purpose? Why would God create them and not give them the one and only purpose, number one? Number two, which is related to that, what about people in New Guinea or certain countries at the time who never come across Christianity? If it's the only path, what's the point of their life? So that, those were two questions. When you're 14, reasonably intelligent, you can see when someone's, I'll use a polite word, waffling, and they don't really know the answer. And I could tell the dean didn't have an answer to that. 
and, and uh, I haven't found one inside the church that satisfies me anyway. So those were two of them. And the other question, very simple, was I haven't yet met anybody aged 14 who I thought belonged in heaven or hell, based on what I was told, uh, you know, that heaven's a place where the angels are and where you listen to harp music and you eat grapes and it's, you know, they, they're saintly people, or hell where you burn and you're, you know, you're persecuted by the devil and because you're so evil. So most of the people I've met aren't saintly or evil. They're, they're sort of, they like their sport, they like watching their soap opera, they like an ordinary life. Where do they go? They don't belong, it doesn't seem to me they belong in heaven or hell. They may not be Christians, but they're perfectly decent people. And again, I didn't get an answer to that question that satisfied me at all. And the final advice he gave me was, look, don't worry about these questions. You know, you'll find over the years, because the school I went to that produced a lot of priests, and I actually had half a mind to become a priest myself before this. Uh, you'll find that they'll go away. The questions will go away and they won't bother you anymore and you'll just get used to them. So that was the final advice. Just don't think about it. And that, well, I, I knew that wasn't going to happen. So then I started my quest and I found it, as you rightly say, through, through Dr. King. But first of all, just prior to that, through the Eastern religions, through, through Patanjali and through yo the yoga path, and I could see there was, in fact, the fa my favorite title actually was a book, I think authored by Christopher Isherwood. Um, and he was connected to the Swami Vivekananda Vedanta movement. And it was called How to Know God. And I thought that is a great title, you know, not how to believe in God, not how to have faith in God. This is someone who says how to know God. So I was, I was kind of interested in that. And then I came across Dr. King and that was, he went one step further as far as I'm concerned, even than that. Fascinating. I love the journey yeah. of, um, you know, a young boy, 14 years old, a teenager, asking those questions. Those questions are like the foundation of people's awakening. Who am I? Why am I here? And yeah. start to question, that's like your inner wisdom coming out. And you had you were you were seeking outside of yourself to get the answers, and when you didn't get the answers, that put you fully on your path. So, Dr. George King, tell us about him. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Just one thing I would say, in case this for anyone listening or watching can relate to this, I've sort of come to a conclusion because I'm a great believer in past lives, in reincarnation, and, and not just in, in that, you know, I think you can even remember, if not the life, things about it, and, and uh, I know you can, for sure, and I'm sure people relate to that, and I do think that we're all different, and if you've had someone who's reached a certain level in a former life, uh, they could come back and have an experience in this life, which to nearly everybody would be really great. But for that, for someone who's reached a certain spiritual level, I'm certainly not claiming anything too elevated here. It wouldn't hit the spot. They would need more than that. Where for someone else, they might not. They might be perfectly satisfied with, uh, or perhaps think it was marvelous just to have a good material life, and that's that. But I think you, you know, a more advanced soul, if you like, that's not going to be enough for them. Um, anyway, moving on to Dr. King, who was a really advanced soul. I mean, I, I, in a completely different league from somebody like myself. Um, he was just the most remarkable person. When I first heard about him, one thing he did, he, which slightly differed from some of the Eastern things I found, which I do love the Af aphorisms of Patanjali and, and, other, and other great Eastern to the Tao Te Ching and many others, actually. But he immediately stress service and some of the eastern tr traditions don't um there you know you go on your quest to find enlightenment for yourself you go on your quest to find god realization for yourself it's very noble I'm, and i'm not saying they didn't i think they did some of them but he always put service even above that i mean if you have god realization you'll be able to serve far more effectively so it was still a, a something to get, do gain 
But the real motive behind all these things is service and not just service, service to the whole, not, not just people you know, not just you know, family and friends, not just country, your own people in your country, but all over the world. And so that marked him out straight away. But ha having said that, he was a, a very advanced yoga master himself. Uh, he'd done it in London. Uh, he'd mastered it in London. He had to earn a job, but he still did his practice over eight hours a day for 10 years, which I haven't found anyone else to do that, as well as his job. He had to earn, he didn't have his own money. Um, so he had to sort of basically live in the world and still attain the elevated states of samadhi, of, of deep meditation and so on, which he did. And then after that, he was contacted by what we call cosmic masters. In the, in, and he founded the Aetherius Society, which you mentioned earlier, in 1955. And he's certainly not the only, I mean, I've written a book about, which includes a number of ET contacts in it. Um, it's called UFOs and the Extraterrestrial Message, but it's mainly about him because, to me anyway, he really does stand very tall. I, I did an interview actually recently with George Norrie on Coast to Coast, and he, he's come across over the years pretty well nearly every ET contact you could think of. But he said that, he said on the show, he said he, Dr. George King was just way ahead of his time. And he was. I mean, he was saying things in the 50s that people are saying, just starting to say now. OK, really fascinating. And he's your mentor yeah. and you wrote a book with him and you learned a lot from him. What I love is that yoga was a, a, a driving force. Yoga was the yoke. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, this whole thing and and you said you mentioned that you you do believe in past lives and reincarnation and you know we can just read autobiography of a yogi and learn more about what um, the yogic tradition thinks of this yeah. Yeah. there's many many stories and then you mentioned the cosmic masters the cosmic masters can you explain a little bit more about who those are and how they began to work with Dr. King and even yourself. Well, I don't claim myself to have had contacts from Cosmic Masters. I work with them. Yes, I do. And uh, we have for certain things that we do in the Ethereum Society, just a very small number of us have a method of communication with them as opposed to receiving communications from them. I would put out a warning, and I, I would apply this to me, and I'd apply this to the Ethereum Society and to Dr. King as well, which is I would advise people to, do, to discriminate really carefully on this movement. And don't take my word for anything at all. I mean, please check it out carefully. Um, I invite you to do that with Dr. King and, and form your own conclusions, um, because especially at the moment, a lot of people are being encouraged to have ET contacts, and they are given the idea that, that you know it's very easy to do, and you can quite easily gain telepathic communications from cosmic intelligences. We say masters, I want to be clear here, that's not male, that's just a term. Uh, they could be just as much female or more female, or neither actually. So it, it's not limited to, to, to gender at all, this, and Dr. King was clear about that from the beginning. Um, so if you, if you take some that have come to earth through history in our belief, and, and this is a little controversial, I suppose, one would be Jesus. Star of Bethlehem was no star. <laughs> it can't have been a star. Um, uh, you know, Moses would be another. Uh, Sri Krishna would be another. The Lord Buddha would be another. And in their missions to earth, they adopted male bodies, which was required because of us on earth, because of our very limited history and our prejudice, which um, made it very difficult for people in a female body to do uh, a mission like that. Um, but they were no more male than they were female, those intelligences I've named there. Um, so you mentioned also one of my favorite people, Paramahansa Yogananda, um, an autobiography of a yogi, and one of the masters he names, in fact, the one that he revered the most, the one that he, whose ashram he wished to join 
and was promised that he would join after that very difficult life he led. I mean, there was a life of service. I mean, he gave up enlightened states of consciousness to come over to America and the West in general and serve. So he was a fantastic example of service. Master that I was referencing there is the Lord Babaji, a name that's been used by different people, I should say, but the real, if you like, the, the, the real one that he's referring to would be a cosmic master for sure, but living on earth. Okay, yes, Babaji, Babaji, mm. uh, a bodhisattva who, yeah. uh, can you explain bodhisattva for those I who could. are not familiar? That's a, that's a service for ascension of all humanity of sorts. Yes, it is. And, you know, it's interesting because, again, when you look at the Eastern teachings, I still love the Eastern teachings. I mean, right now I'm studying the life of someone who it looks as though they entered um, Nerva Kalpa Samadhi, cosmic consciousness, and that's rare, very rarely done. So I'm always interested if I come across someone who I, the moment, I'm, I won't name him because I'm not yet sure, but I think he was a genuine case. Uh, it's rare. And, but uh, what you're talking about, a bodhisattva, uh, someone who's been through ascension, as the theosophists would, would put it, and so would we in the Ethereum Society, is even much greater than that. That's, that's someone who has not only entered cosmic consciousness, and Yogananda, as you know, describes cosmic consciousness. Dr. King describes it in the book, The Nine Freedoms. Uh, I think it's outstanding, Dr. King's description of cosmic consciousness. But he would say, Dr. King would say, there's a big gap between attaining that state even, and that's as high as it gets really, uh, in terms of consciousness, and becoming a bodhisattva or going through ascension. And there are one or two, no, perhaps the most famous in the West is Count Saint Germain, but mainly their Eastern names that one thinks of. Um, in the case of the Lord Babaji though, I believe he's, he's, he's even above that. I mean, he's the guru of the, of the guru. He's the guru of ascended masters. He is not even from this world, I believe. Not even from this world. And uh, it's just so beautiful, the, the message of service. And we hear that as well, even in the ufology crowds. It's time, this is where, you know, all as much as there's um, polarity in our collective right now, we can still see everyone does agree on certain elements and everyone agrees yeah. on peace and harmony and happiness and freedom. Yep. So yep. I think that's really good. Um, but the service, instead of service to self, it's service to others. And yeah. that's where that goes hand in hand with ascension then, would you agree? I would, I mean, I think what happens, you know, if you are advanced enough, and I'm not, I want to stress that I'm not at that level, but if a person was advanced enough to enter cosmic consciousness, uh, truly enter it. There are many claims and there's lots of nonsense, in my opinion, spoken about cosmic consciousness, sadly enough. And mm. that too is made to seem as easy as falling off a log, as, as we say over here. You know, it, and it isn't. It's really difficult. And, and unless you've had several lives mm. of service, you, you won't do it in this life. It's not an easy thing, but it's attainable. That's the good news. Anyone could. They set their mind to it. They could do it. They'd have to set their mind. It won't just happen. And that you can, you can discriminate quite carefully there where people say, oh, I was walking along one day and I suddenly became enlightened. No. You may have had a great experience. Yes, absolutely. An enlightening experience. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a, a vision, many things. But in the, the true state of enlightenment, because what I find, Lauren, although this might sound discouraging to some people, um, there's, a, there's a great saying by Michelangelo, the, you know, the artist and, and sculptor, and he said, my fear, uh, this isn't the exact quote, but something like this, my fear is not that um, you aim too high and miss it. The greatest danger is you aim too low and reach it. And I've always remembered that because I think the people who make it all sound easy and oh yeah, this is happening to everyone and it's so everyone can do it like easily, like over a weekend and so on. They're okay, they might be encouraging a lot of people, but they are belittling something. They are lowering a standard and they're taking something away from people. 
which is a vision of something much, much greater, which takes effort, you know, yes, but can come. And, but even then though, you still got to, and this is something Dr. King stressed, come out of that state and serve as Yogananda did. Uh, he, he, he left it basically. He, he, if he'd stayed in India, um, I'm sure he would have bathed in those blissful states for long periods, but he gave that up to serve. And that's exactly the example. And Dr. King's another example. He, he, he took his road, he achieved his aim. And then in all the years that certainly that I knew him and I'm sure before, he gave that up and de devoted himself in service. And his mission was uh, got to get 43 years after, after gaining cosmic consciousness and samadhi. All right, that is that is beautiful, and it empowers all of us listening when we get wisdom and information to share it. I know so many just say, "Who am I to do that?" But this is part of the service that you're talking about. We share yeah. this wisdom, and we're going to talk more about this about how we help change the world with our intuition and our spiritual powers. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to that in a moment, but. I wanted to ask you more about, well, a couple things, cosmic consciousness. Let's start there. Hmm. Um, and as we know from autobiography of a yogi, there are other worlds and beings on other worlds. And so that ET connection is right there. But first, before we get there, um, what is cosmic consciousness to you? Or what, what is your definition of cosmic consciousness? If I may, I'd like to recommend a book, just for a moment, as well as Autobiography of Yoga, another book, which is not written by me at all. I wrote the forward to it much later, but it was written by Dr. King, it's called The Nine Freedoms. And in that book, there's a whole chapter on exactly what cosmic consciousness is. And also I do a podcast called The Spiritual Freedom Show. And we've been looking at cosmic consciousness quite a bit in the last few, and we'll be looking at it more. But what it is, is it's come under many names. Um, you know, in the Eastern tradition, they use the word samadhi. And that is also belittled by some people who claim to have entered samadhi, who clearly haven't. That's not to be judgmental. It's just, again, to stop taking away from the, the greatness of this state. It, they may have had, you know, great meditations and wonderful things. But samadhi, it, it, as at its height anyway, uh, I haven't entered it. And it's, um, you know, uh, I've, I've got a thing I've just, shall I answer this that's just popped up here from Kelly? Um, so Kelly, the, the title you asked what it was, is The Nine Freedoms. And it's by George King. And it, you'll, find it, you'll find it at Amazon, you'll find it at uh, ethereus.org. That's the name of the publisher, A E T H E R I U S dot org. But you, you'll find that book, and I reckon, and it's also in Kindle too, if you go by Kindle. But coming, coming back to cosmic consciousness, it's also known as Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And, and in true Samadhi, which I haven't entered, but you know, I, I may have sort of made some progress in that direction, let me put it that way. You do enter a state um, in which you are immobile to you along the way actually there's one surefire way um <coughs> excuse me i'm sorry beg your pardon everybody sorry about salud, that. salud. <laughs> thank you there's one sure way you can discriminate actually between people who say they've entered enlightenment or samadhi um is that along the way they will have gained very definite psychic powers now that may not have been their goal and it really, it shouldn't be the goal, actually, even though I wrote a book called Unlock Your Psychic Powers, unless it's to serve others, but it will happen. It will happen in various kinds of ways, such as through out-of-body experience, through definite clairvoyance, through definite clairaudience, through great healing powers. There's a whole variety of ways that you will experience an awakening, which must come as you start to open the higher chakras. So if you get someone, for example, who says they're enlightened or has entered samadhi, who doesn't know this, who, who says that I haven't had psychic powers, I don't need psychic powers, I don't know anything about psychic powers, then you'll know they haven't really entered that state fully. It's an easy way to, they might have entered some very nice 
peaceful um, state of detachment and so on. I don't want to take away from it, but it won't be that. I know a very, I, mean, I don't know, but I've met an extremely famous writer on enlightenment. And, you know, that isn't my idea of enlightenment, but I don't, I'm sure he's done tremendous service to a lot of people and helped many people. So I'm not taking away from that. Um, so that's one of the, the hallmarks, but cosmic consciousness is like that taken to the nth degree. Now, for those who know about Kundalini, it's the raising of the force of Kundalini, which is the inner power within us, within all of us, in its entirety to the highest psychic center. That would be like a technical definition. And the highest psychic center, which is even above the third eye, is the Brahma chakra or crown center, just above the top of the head. If you, if you have entered cosmic consciousness fully, and I haven't, I'm going to keep stressing that, you will have raised that force, which is a real tangible force, that I know, it's not a theory, it's not just an idea, uh, in its entirety. But there are many roots to this. I mean, there's a Zen Buddhist root, you might say, which won't use the term cosmic consciousness. They take a path which they call the no thought path. Um, and it, they arrive at the same destination or perhaps almost the same destination through a different route. So you don't have to go through the Kundalini route to get there. But Dr. King did. He was a master of Kundalini yoga, among other yogas. Really fascinating. Really, really fascinating. So you brought up a, a, a bunch of really good points. And this is where we're going to talk a little bit deeper about how we open our psychic powers, gain our psychic powers. We even have a webinar coming up with you, a mastery empowerment course, where you're going to go into the details of your book. We'll talk more about that. Um, isn't it interesting that we've heard near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences absolutely heighten the yeah. psychic ability? Yeah. Is that because there's an awareness? We see things more, and this is where we can say, what's the practice to get there, the meditation, uh, yoga? But is, um, is that what's going on there? And then it brings to mind, you mentioned the clairaudience and the clairvoyance. When we have ringing in our ears, is that something? It's, I'm not talking about tinnitus where it's a constant yeah. ringing, but it's like energy, an energy shift. Yeah. And you share a little bit about- Yes, it can be. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. No, no. Well, it, it can be, it can happen in so many ways. And, and also I've done a lot of phone-ins, particularly over here in Britain, and we open the lines to people who, who are inverted commas, ordinary people, if there is such a thing as an ordinary person. Uh, but people who wouldn't claim to be psychic, in fact, they would tell you they're not psychic, they're not mediums. And they phone up and ask me about their experiences, which are psychic experiences. And it's phenomenal how many of these are just going on to people who aren't even practicing spiritual practices in their life. They're just having a contact with someone who's died perhaps a loved one, it's happened a lot. Um, they're, they're having perhaps an out of body experience where they just find themselves, I met one person who, who was in a dentist chair and suddenly found themselves floating up above, the, uh, above their body and looking down, um, which is quite good in it when you're having dental work done. I should think it gets you out the body and uh, why not? But that's a joke. But I mean, you, you get um, you know, all kinds of cases, and some of them quite marked. Now, these are anecdotes, you know, I'm, but um, I did, I am sure that a lot of it going on. When you take to some form of spiritual practice, and there are many, there's not one. There's not a one and only way. That's one thing I have found. <laughs> there are many paths, and you choose your path. I mean, I've chosen my path, but I respect other paths. Uh, if it's a, an effective path, then things will start to happen. And you've mentioned a couple of them. One of them, if you're developing clairvoyance, uh, clairaudience, sorry, which is clear hearing, psychic hearing, you will start to hear not in your uh, imagination and nor physically, that can happen, but I don't mean physically, as it were, a, a psychic sound. It can be a drum beat. It could be a bell ringing. Um, now, though signs if you want to call them signs that you're getting as you do your practices 
are encouraging to you. As what they often are, by the way, is the awakening of the heart center to some degree. Um, now, clairvoyance, the same. And you'll find this in any proper teaching. And they, they, they refer to it in different ways. They might call um, them gu spirit guides that have contacted you. Some will say dakinis if they're you know, of an Eastern tradition or whatever they call it. There are many names for these things. But there is common ground from completely different traditions. Now, one thing you will start to get if you do yoga breathing, as I do every day, I still do every day, I really recommend it. Um, you'll start to see lights in what appears to be the third eye. I'm going to say what appears to be the third eye, because at first, it could be a lower chakra than that. It just seems to be there. It could be an awakening of the solar plexus center, for example, which is still uh, you know, necessary. It's a very uh, active center in psychic things. Um, but eventually, you'll start to reach a point where you start to actually look through the third eye. Now, these are real things. Th these aren't based, as I mentioned earlier, on faith or belief or opinion. And, you know, they're, they're done and they should be done in a very balanced way, a very just calm, actually very calm manner. Uh, you certainly don't want to overreact at all if, if you have psychic experiences or allow the emotions to kick in because they can distort these experiences and your imagination will try and kick in and usually with most people it does actually and so it's not going to be then 100 percent accurate but if you're just having signs like those like seeing lights in the what seems to be the forehead or just in front of the forehead or hearing the, some of those sounds they are indications of an awakening if you like there are many others you can have you can you can sense psychic energy one of the practices i'm going to teach people when we do our, our webinar they they i can't guarantee it they're very likely to sense in certain ways spiritual energy uh, which flows throughout the universe and can be used to heal other people and heal yourself by the way too there's absolutely nothing wrong everything right about healing yourself too and it's a real thing so this is experience based when you really start to move beyond that, and I certainly in my case, it's been clairaudience mainly, um, then you will start to do more than just hear sort of sounds intermittently giving you encouragement and so on. You will actually start to be able, um, if you go down this direction, and you certainly don't have to, to uh, receive communications. But you want to be really careful with that. I want to really stress that. And I, I would recommend people, actually, if they, if they do want to receive communication, certainly what I did anyway, don't just rely on telepathy, um, as many say they do. Uh, also develop clairaudience because you will then get a sound. It's, it's not a physical sound, but it's out. And you can then tell the difference, and this is vital, between your own imagination and an outside communicator. And that's key because you need to do that. Um, you can even tell the difference and you absolutely tell the difference between an outside communication from another source, under, under most conditions anyway, I don't want to ever be dogmatic, but under most conditions, and your own intuition. But if it was one, if I was said, which would you value the, the highest, your own intuition, or the communication from a higher source, strangely, it might sound strange to some people, but I would put intuition first. Because if you lose that, you've lost everything. And, and I myself when I first started a little bit. So you, you don't want to lose your own intuition and you do want to have control. And that's what I'm gonna teach people over your psychic development. Because if you don't, it could, be, could even be quite dangerous. You could even enter into sort of mental health areas if you're not careful. But if you do it under your own control, is a key word. You're, you're not controlling anyone else, let me say, but just controlling yourself. You can switch it on and off like a tap. It, it's slower, but it's much, much safer. Very interesting what you bring up. And 
it's what, from experience really Lauren. yeah and so what i what i know from looking around at people who may not know that this is going on um you you mentioned awakening of the heart center and that really is when we use the word awakened we're talking about the heart center being awakened Would right. you, okay i know that just came into my um awareness really it's like what does awakening mean but it really is the heart center opening up it's and, interesting and very and, interesting point and even the yogic readings teachings say that in a person's life in the 40s there's something that if you're not working on it it's almost like a cosmic two by four comes and taps you on the shoulder to do something energetically and then you talked about spiritual energy these are energies maybe it's our own guides maybe it's a higher self doing something to help us wake up and sadly if people have an experience and they don't know what to do with it they could be misdiagnosed as schizophrenic or um, what is it, bipolar? Or maybe mm -hmm. people really are bipolar. Do you see a correlation between people who have experiences like this and then mistakenly get put on um, pharmaceuticals to assist in the stability of the mind? I think it's a really, really important question, if I may say, what you've raised there. Um, in essence, I don't see that there's a correlation between mental health disorders, it Good. isn't quite what you asked, but and spiritual development. Good, okay. Uh, there doesn't need to be at all. But I do think that in certain cases, and particularly where you get possibly well intentioned and possibly not well intentioned, but either way, bad advice uh, by so called teachers, it can lead to that. And, and I've mentioned ET contact. If you've got someone, and it's going out now, and I could name names, but I don't choose to name names, uh, very well-known people um, going out saying, look, you know, if you do this, 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 and this, and you follow these guidelines in such and such a handbook, you can go out and you can get an ET contact with the Pleiades, with Sirius, with some extra galactic planet you've never heard of, and you could gain telepathic rapport by doing that, you are putting those people in danger. I, I'll go that far now. Hopefully, it won't lead to that. Hopefully, they'll be sensible enough to say, well, actually, that didn't work. I, I didn't gain rapport with anyone from the Pleiades. Because you, you won't. I mean, I, not, not that easily. I, I'm, I'm sorry, this might be discouraging to some, might annoy some people, but... I'm trying to help everyone here. Um, you can have contacts, certainly, with people on other realms of this earth. You can have UFO close encounters. Yes, it happens. You could even have a, what I might call a benign abduction, even. It, these things could happen. They have happened. But you aren't going to become, should we say, an ongoing regular just by going out and following some guidelines one summer's evening. Not, a safe, not safely. And, um, you know, that, that, so the dangers then is what you've described there. That's just one example. It's same, same, I could say the same about certain teachers of Kundalini yoga. Um, you know, that too, if it's not done correctly, could lead to mental health disorders. Could do. Um, you, you know, it's very important to have the right teacher. I was really, really lucky. I didn't expect to become a close friend of his as well. That's Dr. George King. That, that was not what I thought would happen when I first encountered him when I was 18 years old. But I did. And he was everything he made out to be. So to find that, that's wonderful. But there's an awful lot of people out there. I think it's more a case of people being uh, misguided than being um, badly intentioned. I, I think most of the people who are giving sort of slightly dangerous advice, they, they are sincere people on the whole. They believe it when they teach it, you know, and that this, this is, but it's just as dangerous. So that's why, and please don't get me wrong. I, the only thing that's safe is Dr. George. I'm not saying that there's lots of great teachers as Swami Vivekananda, you mentioned Yogananda. There are other very good paths course there are out there but 
you do have to be very careful. Now, as well, you've mentioned, are there people who actually are genuine psychics who are being misdiagnosed as having a mental health issue? I think so. Uh, and in my ideal world, in my ideal world, a psychic practitioner, and I've said this on the radio many times, would certainly be reasonably experienced in counselling as well. Slightly off topic, but you could give good, accurate psychic advice. And I've met people who have. And I, I used to do a show in London. It was the most listened to radio show in London on a Saturday night at one time when we did it. And we had psychics coming in and out of this show and they would do readings over the air for some people. And, you know, uh, you can you can give an accurate reading, but it won't necessarily help a person. I mean, I can give a tragic example of that, actually, of, of a palmist I met who uh, was pretty good, but they weren't at all familiar with counselling or and they weren't listening to their intuition, I believe. That's where it comes down to. But they were psychically accurate. And they, this person was working in his daytime as a hospital porter. And so they, they were asked by a patient to do a palm reading for them. Again, this is only an anecdote. And they did the reading and they said this. They said, you tried to do something twice and you failed. Uh, the third time, you'll try again a third time, but this time you will succeed. And they were correct. That person committed suicide. They tried twice before. So they were accurate. But if anything, they were encouraging that person to do something that was, and, and the person with the, the psychic was mortified. They came to see me and said, shall I give up? Shall I, what should I do? I mean, this is terrible. Um, you know, and I'm not saying it's entirely their fault either, by the way, it could well have happened anyway. But that's an example, I think, where to be a psychic, uh, you, you, you should have some knowledge of, and you should also listen to your intuition. I think if that psychic had still kept their intuition active, as well as their psychic impressions, which they were receiving from the other person, a red light would have come on, a warning light would have come on. They'd have thought, they, and, and you don't need to sort of prove your ability all the time. You can just simply ask a question. Have you tried something twice? If you don't know, find out about it. There's nothing wrong in that. If, they don't, if they're not willing to tell you, they're not serious about the reading anyway. So there are ways of doing it. And I've taught people how to go about giving readings as well and so on. And it's, it's to be done carefully. So that's that side of things. The other side of the things though, I do think a counselor, a psychiatrist, in my opinion, humble opinion, a psychotherapist would be far better, and I've met psychotherapists who agree with me on this, if they were psychic. So I think it works both ways. I think both would be ideal. And yes, you can get people misdiagnosed, and you can also get people who are put out as psychics who actually have a mental health issue. Both things can happen. If you stick to the, you know, the yoga path or you know, the teachings, for example, I'm only giving an example, by Dr. George King, which I've done, and you keep things really controlled and there's no hurry. You don't rush to get results, like got to do it tonight or it doesn't work or anything like that, then you'll be fine. But it's, it's, you've got to be careful with it. Thank you for offering that wisdom for all of us. Um, I have met psychics who have that psychotherapy background and it does make a lot of sense um, right. so thank you so um you say that we all have this ability we can all develop it and nurture it mm -hmm. and we like to say on this show if all we do is anchor people fully in their heart and connect them to the higher self then we've got our job done we've done a good job now, what is your understanding of the higher self? Is there a connection with the higher self as a, a guardian against or a gatekeeper against some of the negative impressions or the psychic impressions that you might get? Is, well, uh, I, I, um, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I might use the term slightly differently from sure. you. Yes. But higher self, as I see higher self, is 
absolutely spot, you're spot on from where I'm sitting here. That is absolutely the goal. And um, if you, I mean, you could say in cosmic consciousness, that's exactly what happens. You contact, you fully contact, as fully as it's possible to contact it on this planet anyway, your higher self, which is, if you like, your divine spark, which is your real self. There's different words for it. And some people would say your Buddha nature. There are, there are different phrases for it. Uh, or God, if you like, the spark of God um, or Brahma. Um, yes, yeah, so if you, if you keep that in sight, you will never go wrong. You know, if you, if you really stick in line with your higher self. Now, your higher self speaks to, or our higher selves speak to us through our intuition. So that's what I was really talking about. That's what I, I do mean. And so uh, you've got to learn the difference between your intuition and your imagination. It's an incredibly simple concept but it's a very difficult thing to really do, uh, but you can do it. Um, and, you know, sometimes you won't know, by the way, I, I don't want to make this sound impossible to people. Sometimes a thought will pop into your, your head. You don't know whether it's from outside, from inside, where it comes from. Uh, it's quite a safe thing to do. It might be, let me give an example. You might be walking down a road and suddenly you think, I'm going to go down that street. I need to go down that street over there. You have no reason to go there at all. You've got time, you've got nothing to lose. So I, I, you go down that street and down that street is someone you've been looking for for years, you've lost touch with them and they happen to be standing right there. Then you think, okay, I don't know what guided me to do that, but whatever it was, was right. And you remember how it felt, or you might go down there and obviously it seems fruitless, there's nothing there. In fact, it's a dead end. And you think, okay, that was just my imagination, silly thought fine you've got to be able to be self-critical you've got to be able to be wrong you know you, you've got to have a sense of humor there's many things you've got to have in this on this path but you'll start to hone it you'll start to well, i say get into a groove you'll start to i you'll recognize it and as i say sometimes you won't know one of the most moving calls on one of those shows was a was a, an air force pilot who was going to parachute and as he was about to parachute a voice came into his head and said, don't jump. In fact, he thinks he heard it physically. Don't jump. Um, check your parachute. I think, I can't remember the exact deal, but it was definitely don't jump. He looked at his parachute. It hadn't been rightly, correctly packed, which is extremely unusual um, because they're very careful, obviously, over that. And he didn't jump. And luckily, he, he says he would have died if he jumped. Now, that's just an anecdote. He doesn't know, who, was it a guardian angel? He, this is his question. Was it my intuition? Was it a guardian angel? I, I don't know. I don't really know at the moment. And in one way, it really doesn't matter because you followed it. And it's, see, it seems to have saved your life. Um, so sometimes that'll happen. It happens to me. I mean, I've done mediumship for over 25 years. But sometimes if I'm driving a car, something comes. I don't know exactly always where from. The only thing that matters, is it good? Is it helpful? Is it uh, true? And if it is, that's great. But sometimes if you really get down to it, and I decided to really get down to it as far as I could, um, I made a real effort with channeling. Now, I don't think everyone should do that. I'm not saying everyone should do that. If I was to say what I think everyone should do or what I'd recommend, it would be healing, which I think is a wonderful thing that everyone can do, not just of, of individuals, but of, of the world. You know, we can make a difference in Ukraine. We, we can make a big difference right now through healing. That's what I would really recommend to everyone. But when I took up channeling, I really, I really made a massive effort. It's not easy. Anyone who tells you it easy is easy isn't accurate. Sorry if that's dogmatic, but it is, you know, you have to make an effort to get it absolutely right. Um, and I think a lot of it goes on. I think people have inspired thoughts. They give inspired talks. They could be unconsciously channeling at times. That's fine. But if you really want to hone it down and really know this is not me now, this is you, you've got to really work at it. And I would recommend for that clear audience. This is why we're really looking forward to a two hour webinar online workshop with you so we can go Good. even deeper into recognizing this. But can you share with us two questions 
Um, first is learning the difference between intuition and imagination. And then you use the word feeling yeah. because we have to go through the experience and also mm -hmm. going through the experience of overriding how the head overrides our intuition. Yeah. And then like, uh oh, I should have listened to that. Um, and it's a journey. It's not going to be, there's no cut and dry answer for it, but can you help us I I explain the, how you, differentiate between intuition and imagination. Absolutely. You made an excellent point, actually, if, if I may say earlier about the heart center and, uh, you know, being a key, the key, if you like. And I think it's so true because it's when you start to tap in, even partially to the heart center, you're then above the solar plexus center. Now, so all the centers are good. None of them are bad. It's like numbers. They're all good. 13 isn't a bad number nor is nine. There's no such thing as a bad number. There's no such thing as a bad day. Um, they're just different. And the psychic centers have different uh, effects. And the solar plexus is, is a very important and extremely powerful psychic center. Um, but when you start to go above that and tap into the heart center, then you're tapping into love, pure love you know, and, and, the, and the purer it is, the better. I would say that if you're able to go even higher than the heart center, to the throat center, to the Christ center, even to some degree, and even above that, if you can at all, safely, then it's even purer and even closer to the, to the divine and an even greater form of love. But certainly heart center is, is absolutely key. Now, the intuition you were, you were, I think I got off topic there, so you'll have to forgive me a bit, but you were asking me the difference between intuition and imagination, and how you tell that difference, I think, was what you, have I got that right? Yeah, so, so again, sometimes you, you, in fact, I'll be definite, you won't know. There are times when you just won't know. And, and again, you know, Socrates said, I'm the wisest man because I know what I don't know. I'm the wisest man in Athens, or was it Greece? I'm not sure which he said, but because I know what I don't know. It's every psychic I've ever taught, and I've taught hundreds, maybe thousands probably over the years, I have said, don't think you have to know all the answers. You can say, I don't know. It's more honest to do that. And if somebody comes to you and they want an answer and you don't know it and they don't like it, they can go, forget them. They're not serious people. You, you can give them what you do know um, and you have to be able to say you don't know. So with imagination and intuition, sometimes you won't know. But what will start to happen, and everyone's completely individual, and that's why personal guidance, personal instruction is so valuable, actually, because everyone has to find their own key. I mean, Nostradamus had his own way, according to his writings anyway. Um, I think people know Nostradamus, don't they? Yeah. Um, so he, he, you know, he, he looked for certain things and, and, and when a certain light, I think it was a flame that he saw, then he knew he was on and he knew he could then prophesy and so on. And, and different people have different things and you sense it. You do, as you rightly said, you feel it. You get into a groove, you get, it, you get on, you're right on it. Uh, you're not negating your consciousness, by the way. You're, you're not negating your thoughts. That's not recommended. You are controlling them. There's a very big difference between those two things, which is something that you can learn. In fact, the, the, the great Zen Buddhist gurus said that, like Hui Neng and other people. Uh, they, they drew the distinction between no thought where you try to stop thoughts and no thought where you allow the thoughts to come, but you detach from those thoughts and take your mind somewhere else. A big key. Dr. King gave a beautiful image, which I'll share. I was going to put it in the webinar, I will, but I'll just share this image. And forgive me if you're, um, you know, against eating meat, fish, and so on, but it's an, only an image. And it's the image of a fisherman. And he said that it's, it's, you go, it's like you go fishing, you throw the line out, and you allow the fish, fish to, 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 to take the bait. You, it's, and you, you don't immediately try and reel it in and force the fish in because you'll lose the fish. You let it reel out. You allow it to reel out. And then you gradually, okay, not a very pleasant image, forgive me, but then you, it's an old yogic thing. 
you gradually reel it in. You're gaining control over your mind. I'm sure we can find a better image than that somewhere. But it's, it's gaining control. It's gentle. It's not forced. I suppose that's what I'm looking for. It's unforced. It's focused, but unforced. That's what I'd say about it. You are making an effort. You are concentrating. You aren't negating your thoughts, but you're not trying to force it. And you get into this sort of groove and you recognize it. You know you're in it. You got used to it. Now, in the early stages, you don't know, and it doesn't matter. Uh, and you, that's why you need to practice. That's why if you get an impression to phone someone, and, it, and they're you know, you know, close enough to them, you're not bothering them, it's okay to phone them, phone them if you've got the time. And say, look, you know, let's say there's someone who wouldn't mind being phoned. Say, look, I, I felt I should phone you. Is there anything going on? Is there anything, you know? And they might say, no, nothing, everything's fine which may or may not be true, by the way, but let's say it was true, you think, okay, that must be my imagination then. Or they might say, God, and thank goodness you phoned. I absolutely needed you to get hold of you. And you think, okay. And then you just remember, particularly in the second case, you remember how it felt when you got that impression and you start to identify it. And it might come with some kind of psychic ability might come with a vision, might come with a sound, might come with perhaps most common of all, just a feeling, clairsentience. Um, but you, you get used to it and it's just practice. You get used to it and it's practice, practice, practice. Yes, yeah. yes, okay. Um, I wanted to point our listeners, before we go on to the next few questions, I wanted to point our listeners to the link here, it's in our chat in the Zoom chat line and on this web page or in the viewing description box of this video, you'll see a link to a special offer where Richard will be hosting a webinar, two hours in a webinar teaching the principles of what we're covering today. Would you like to say anything more about this uh, upcoming class and what we're going to learn in this class? Oh, I think some of the things we'll try to cover, or we'll not try to, we will cover, are um, healing. Certainly how everyone can heal. Um, how you can heal yourself. How you can sense spiritual energy as a tangible thing and, and feel it yourself. Uh, we'll do a little bit on positive thinking and, and how you can make that manifest and it'll improve your life. It can only improve your life. How you can perhaps you know, and this may not happen immediately, but with practice, look into at least your near future and see what's coming a bit and, and actually smooth the way for yourself a bit forward. But, and also one very important thing, how you can make a difference in the world through world healing, or some people might call that prayer. These are words, um, prayer energy, if you like. Now, you may or may not be religious. You may or may not like religion. Uh, but whether you do or you don't, you can make a difference. You can pray. You can, you can send out energy to others. And as I mentioned, just to name one example, the Ukraine. You know, wars aren't stopped in the end, I don't believe, by certainly not by money, because the moneyed interests, are, they like war to continue, actually, on this planet, sadly enough. And they aren't generally stopped by politics. They're stopped by, and if they are stopped by politics, it's only temporary, as we've seen in the Middle East, just to name one area. They are stopped by a change of consciousness. That's how war is stopped. That's how peace comes, that the people don't want war. And the people take compassion on their so-called enemy. And it, those are changes of consciousness, which can be enhanced through prayer, through world healing, if you prefer to call it that through sending out positive energy. So we'll, we'll touch on that too. But I'll t I won't touch on it. I'll teach people methods to do these things. Really looking forward to that with you, that time with you. And we invite all of those watching and listening to check it out. Check out the link and join us. We are excited. And so you touched on a really good point. And there is help with, you mentioned, 
everyone should heal everyone can heal and then you mentioned spiritual energy is it the spiritual energy that is the healing and is that what we mean by energetic transmissions where yeah. we, we can transmit this energy so tell us um i know we're going to do more in the workshop but what's going on and how do we attain the how do we recognize that spiritual energy how to feel it and is a wonderful um thing that i discovered only because a publisher asked me to write a particular book and the book was called prayer energy and they approached me they said we know we could have approached different authors we know you know they knew i'd done books but they so we, we wanted someone who really did it, not someone who just wrote a book on Feng Shui or whatever, you know, as an author. They wanted someone who really did it. And so in the course of that book, uh, excuse me, I had to look into, with the help of Mark Bennett, who co-authored it with me, who works with me, um, many prayers from many different traditions. And that was a very wonderful thing because numerous different backgrounds and faiths and religions and indigenous tribal prayers and so on uh, all were working knowingly or unknowing it's not for me to say but to the same end which is to 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 try, may not they wouldn't have put it this way a lot of them but to transmit spiritual energy through the through the prayer to the source of that prayer which might be a child might be nature forces in in um you know shall we say a weather condition um, nature forces really do exist and you can send them energy and you can feel the reaction to sending them energy as well um, you can send it obviously for healing you can send it to someone you know who has agreed to receive healing from you and you can set a time 9 p.m tuesday evening i will be sending you healing and they can cooperate at 9 p.m they might be on the other side of the globe but they can cooperate with you and enhance that healing into themselves. Um, so, you know, prayer energy, to answer your question, I think your phrase energetic transmission is what it's all about, actually. It's, and that's what it should be about. It shouldn't be, a prayer shouldn't be, oh God, could I please have a better car? Or, you know, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's not a load of requests you make for yourself to God, or please forgive me because I shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, it's good to feel remorse sometimes, but, um, you know, there's still karma. You're going to, even if you are forgiven, you've still got to work through your karma. We all have. So, but in terms of real prayer, it's sending out energy for others, individuals and the world, as I mentioned earlier yourself, and that is an energetic transmission. And one thing we will do in the webinar, we will, we will channel energy to ourselves. And I'm hoping uh, that, and I've done this on live radio here, even with the members of the public, as opposed to serious students like we'll have in this class. And ordinary, as I say, keep saying ordinary people have felt it as a real tangible force. What it is in, in, in yoga is prana. Uh, what it is in, in oriental traditions is chi. Uh, it, it's got many names, actually, through history, but it's one energy. Well, okay, beautiful. This is the power that we hold. And I know everyone watching and listening can feel that and see the importance of it and feel the inspiration of doing this in our life. You know, many times we have heavy hearts for the environment and yeah. um, uh, the wars and things. So mm. this is the higher route to follow. Mm in the face of everything. And we've said this on this show, love in the face of everything. Yeah. And you've just given great meaning to the power of that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share a quick story um, mm -hmm. that illustrates it because as you were speaking, I was like, well, yeah, I've done that. And we play a game, a, a, a friend of mine who actually knows when we're being telepathic to each other. Right. We call each other, we practice we've played around with like this is so it may seem mundane but turbulence on an airplane for example the pilot will come on and say buckle your seat belts flight attendants are going to get in their jump seat early because mm -hmm. we got turbulence and that used to frighten me but mm -hmm. one time instead of going into the fear 
I stayed very calm and relaxed. I think at one point I called on Archangel Michael mm -hmm. and I just, uh, I, I stayed calm. And now as I'm reflecting on this story, what I was doing is what you were talking about is tuning into a spiritual energy of calm and peace and mm -hmm. actually going to the nature for us forces. I spoke to the great sylphs of the sky mm -hmm. and I envisioned total ease and grace. And when I did that, we made it all the way into Denver with not a bounce, not a bounce or a bump, wow. only one, one little boom and that was it. But when I got home to my house, the upstairs door had been blown in because it was so windy. So that yeah. to me was like, wow, isn't yeah. that incredible? What's going That's on? That's a great experience there. Yeah, what's well, the power of the mind? I mean, you know, you could be sitting in an office uh, where there is a lot of aggravation, a lot of bad vibes, a lot of anger, a lot of, you know, jealousy, mm. all the things that go on in some offices. Not my office, I have to say, hopefully, but, and I'm sure not yours, but in, a, in, you know, in the workplace and people have to go into the workplace. And I'm sure some of the people watching this, they have to go in and the atmosphere is not, or it could be actually in a family, it could be anywhere, but you could be sitting there and unbeknown to everyone in that office, you're practicing a practice. And I will give one right now, actually called the violet flame practice. And that comes from mother earth. And that's one thing that was above all else to Dr. King, actually. And it's wonderful to see increasing concern for Mother Earth, not just for us and to our children and our grandchildren and, you know, helping the environment for our sake, but Mother Earth for her sake, the living planet on which we live, the closest thing to God we will ever touch. And if you visualize, a vi you could be on a... 10 story building at the top. But if you visualize a violet flame coming up through you from the ground, it's better if you're standing on the ground with bare feet, mind you, if you can do that, it will protect you and cleanse you. So you could be in that office visualizing the violet flame, which is all transmuting, true love, uh, and it'll come through you. It, you might not sense it at first, but in pra with practice, you will. And it could affect everyone in the office and suddenly everything settles. They don't know why. They don't know what you've been doing even, but everybody changes. Um, you could be, somebody could be yelling at you. You could be in an argument where someone is, is berating you and unfairly and, and, and unnecessarily. And you could look at them in the eyes. And while if, this is difficult to do, I have to say, you could be blessing them mentally. And it has a great power. I had to do that when I was a, a school teacher in a social priority school with a very violent kid. And, you know, it was, it was, um, it was the last resort I had left, really, because um, he had a chair almost. And it did work in that particular case, or he backed off for whatever reason. But that's all I could think of doing at that moment. And he did back off. Um, you know, I'm not going to guarantee that will is enough i mean if you're in a dangerous situation and you can get out of it get out of it that's let me be we've got to be practical we've got to be sensible but these things really do work and in your case it seems to work beautifully yes and coming to mind you know if we're in a dangerous situation weave those four miraculous phrases the ho'oponopono thank you i love you please forgive me i'm sorry that too is magical mm -hmm. and i'm i'm sure that the violet flame energy uh, the Ho'oponopono is, is words that are uh, embedded in that violet flame because we've okay. seen things just diminish, dissolve, yeah. disappear yeah. with that. So really powerful. Thank you, Richard. Mm. We have a question, and this one is a good one that will probably sum up the entire conversation. What is your personal process for connecting with higher realm beings? Right. Well, I think the first thing, that is a good question, if I may say, I think the first thing is that people have to be, and I have to be, respectful. So once again, I come back to some of the so-called um, teachings that are out there, and people say, come on this weekend course. 
and you can contact whatever being you like, be it the Virgin Mary, be it uh, Count St. Germain, be it whoever. And that is disrespectful because what you're then saying is that all these great beings at your beck and call, you happen to be on a course that weekend so they can jolly well come and communicate, even if you were able to receive their communications. So it isn't always a question of you deciding, it can often be a question of them deciding. Now, when I, when I started out, I, I used to give psychic readings and I was helped greatly in those psychic readings by guides. They came to help me because they wanted to help the people I was giving readings to. And in the early, I had to learn, and I made mistakes, as I mentioned earlier, right at the beginning, I had to learn myself to tell the difference between myself and these guys. That's, that's why I know. And I went through a phase early on where I stopped listening to my intuition. I was so kind of, I was in my 20s at the time. I was so excited and sort of thrilled to be getting these communications. They weren't from other planets. These were from people um, on this, from this earth, on other realms, who, who have physically died and are now on other realms. They will reincarnate. They weren't bodhisattvas. They were wise people let's put it that way and they could help me and they could see things i couldn't see i was so thrilled by this i kind of lent on them and i stopped listening to myself and i made mistakes down the line dr king put me right uh, I, I made mistakes with who i thought they were that's why i know from personal experience it's very you've got to be very careful about making claims particularly to have very elevated intelligences and he said, no, that's not who you think it is, um, in a nutshell. I asked him, I went to him and he told me. But I, but I said, well, okay, I've got it wrong. Perhaps I should stop. He said, no, 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 don't stop, carry on. But somewhere down the line, perhaps your guides have gone wrong or something. And I continued and I learned and I found out, I, got, I listened to my intuition as well as the message, but I always had my intuition on, as it were. I never blanked that out. And so I learned then to, to, to get into that groove I've spoken about. Now, interestingly enough, when I was, I, I was, going to, I was told that their teacher, that's these guides who were, who were helping me with these readings, they had a particular teacher who was a very elevated Lama, Tibetan Lama, um, and he wished to communicate with me, but I couldn't, I wasn't able to receive his message. So that's another point people should, should know. I mean, the, as you evolve, as you develop your abilities, you can receive messages from a higher source because you're able, because what it is, you're, you're becoming in tu attuned to that, per, that, into that level of intelligence and they are um, overshadowing you. And in that moment of them overshadowing you, you've got to be at that level, at that point that they're at. That, that's the only way it can work. It doesn't mean you're at their level most of the day or all the time, but you've got to be able to get to that level. And it was around that time I, I was given an initiation by Dr. King. And at certain moments, I was, as it were, using that initiation. And then those moments after I'd done that, which was a, a, an act of service, this particular Lama could contact me. And it was done by appointment then. It's a long-winded answer. Please forgive me for this question. Um, so it might be like 3 p.m. on Sunday. You know, I could be told that by these other guides. He will speak to you. That's how it started. But then I kind of got used to that. I moved to it. And what happens now uh, is that I will get a signal, which is usually a physical one. It feels physical anyway. It could be very, very intense pressure on my skin, usually maybe the ankle or, or, or the leg or something like that, even the toe. I know this sounds very odd, but it, it's unmistakable. It's, it's very intense. It's almost painful, uh, not quite painful, but it's that intense. And only when I register mentally, say, okay, I've got the message. I, I know I'm, I'm aware you want to communicate as it were. I don't know who it is at that point. I might be sitting watching television or anything. Then, the, then it'll stop, it'll immediately stop. And then they'll kind of virtually leave it to me. And I think it may be there's a way then of me picking up the message, possibly even later than they gave it. I don't know that. 
but that's what I tend to think. Uh, they're not at my beck and call, and I'm not always at their beck and call either. I have met mediums who are. They, 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 you know, they're just full of their guides. I don't think that's healthy either. You've got to have a controlled life, but that's the methodology I've ended up with now after all these years, that I'm aware when somebody wants to communicate with me, I have to get myself into sufficient state of consciousness to do it, and then I'll make myself available. Just occasionally, I'll make myself available whether I've been asked to or not. And sometimes you get a message, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you won't. Um, and if I do, it might not be who I expect it to be. It might be someone I've never heard of who lived in 1200 AD. And um, I looked up their name and they existed. That is cool. Wow. So in this workshop... I'm sorry to say, Lauren, I test myself. I don't... I'm, I'm the biggest critic of myself. Uh -huh. and anyone will tell you that. So I... I, I think is that, you know, I'm always checking and testing and I, I, and I always get, you know, as it were, independent proof if I have a new communicator. Sorry. I just thought throw that. That's what makes you such a great teacher. And we're really looking forward to a webinar with you because in a way it's an initiation by you into our psychic powers, unlocking our psychic powers. And I know it's just a little bit, but it provides us with a foundation to just begin the practice, to begin honing those skills and working with them like you did. You now know when you're getting, you're getting a message. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess the, the, one of the last questions would be, is that, um, is it like the same sort of pain every time or could it be yeah. different? Pain's probably too strong. Maybe I shouldn't have said pain. It's, it's, it's strong enough that you can't ignore it without it really hurting a lot. It you know? gets your it wouldn't hurt you. It um, your attention. But, I yeah. we all think about things in our life that was like, wow, okay. That like, just seems to be what's generally happened with me. I, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, we're all different. Somebody might get a vision every time. Somebody might get mm. something else might even just be a gut feeling. But with me, it's a pretty tangible thing. I can't, you know, if somebody really wants to get through to me, but they're very good. As soon as I mentally kind of reply, as it were, and say, look, I, I, I'm aware and I will take this message as soon as I possibly can or something like that. I just think that it stops completely. And there's no, so they don't try and interfere with me. They don't take control over me. They couldn't anyway. Well, I don't think they could. And they don't want to. If they did want to, then you wouldn't want to get a message from them anyway. Uh, so it goes back to a, a, another question, like the ringing of the ears. If that yeah. comes, and I know that there's different, there's sometimes mm. the ringing will be in just one ear or the other ear, no. or you'll just go deaf. The, the, the noise in one ear will just stop, or mm. it'll go from one ear to the other. Is that something to pay attention to? It sounds like you're, you're clairaudient that you're getting those things. Um, so that's a development. That's something you could, if you're getting those things that you've just described there, it's something you could definitely develop further. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would say, it's also, as I mentioned, connected to the heart center generally, the hearing of sounds. And so that's a good, it's, a, it's an encouraging sign. See, there's two things I'd like to do uh, in terms of this uh, event that we're holding. Uh, the one thing, one of the things I'd like people to know that this is, that this is real. You know, this isn't a, a theory or an idea or a leap of faith. These are real things that you can experience and test. And so that's one thing. Number one. And number two, I'd like people to know that they can do it themselves because a lot of people don't have confidence. They think, OK, I've heard about this, but I'm not psychic. I can't. If I've heard that once, I can't heal. I, I, met, I gave a course in New Zealand once on he, a healing course and there was a woman on it. And we were, we were then going to a pop concert, actually, where we'd been asked to give healing, <laughs> strangely, at a, an outdoor festival. And so they wanted as many healers as we could produce. And we'd done this course quite thoroughly. And there was a woman on the course. And, you know, I said, look, any of you want to come along? You are new to this, but you have been taught. And, you know, we're not guaranteeing results, but do come along and help us actually do it. So 
so there's a woman on this course who went on courses. You know, she went on lots of workshops and courses. She didn't really think she could do it, but she went on them anyway. She was interested. So she said, I can't actually do it. I said, look, you can, number one. And number two, you don't know. Somebody, you might cure someone. You don't know what will happen. So, you know, and, and the worst that can happen is you come along and nothing, there's no results. And that won't matter because we're not guaranteeing results anyway. You know, you're just coming along and you'll do your best. So along she comes. And there was a chap who came to her who was partially blind. He had these really thick rimmed glasses. You certainly used to get in those days. This would be back about 30, 40 years ago. But uh, he couldn't see at all well, but he had these very thick rimmed glasses. After one healing from this woman who thought she couldn't do it, he didn't need to use his glasses. Now, I don't know how long that lasted, by the way. It might have lasted forever or it may not, but it certainly had an impact. And she could see that she could do it. So those are the two things. I'd like people to know this is real. This isn't just a theory or an idea. And you can do it. And you are so practical about all of it. It really is beautiful and quite refreshing. You've been on this path a long time and it's real. And you're speaking it boldly and confidently. And that makes you, again, a great guide and a great teacher for thank all you. of us. So we thank you. And I can sense that Dr. George King is right with us in this uh, episode and mm -hmm. sending us the energy. I feel refreshed and invigorated. And I truly hope that everyone watching and listening feels the same way. Again, this is a feeling and you're helping us feel into all of it. As we wrap up our show today, Richard, I want to give you a moment to share any other comments about the workshop or anything you'd like to leave us with. Well, I just come back to that point that I made earlier about consciousness, because the world is a reflection. The world that we live in, you know, there were yogis and uh, monks and so on, particularly in the East in the past, who saw it all as an illusion and they used to call it maya um it's i don't I, I i know where they're coming from but i think it's not it's much better and more healthy and this is something that dr king has taught and also a communicator through him the same one who gave the nine freedoms that i mentioned he's he's called mars sector six he taught that it's actually a reflection of a higher reality now in this world in which we live, if you change the consciousness of the world, and everybody does that to some degree 24 hours a day, you will change the reflection as well. So with healing, you're getting to the source, you're getting not just to the physical body, but to the aura, the mind, the psychic aspect of being. And if you can put that right, um, and, and by all means, follow whatever medical advice as well that you follow. It's not instead of, but you'll get to a deeper level. And as with an individual, so with the world as a whole. So I think this is, in the end, the secret of world peace, of world enlightenment. That I mentioned the yogis, they, in the past, they, they entered these higher states mainly for their own realization. There is one person by the name of Milarepa who lived in the I think 11th century, you, you'd obviously know of. And I, from what his, the stories say, that he knew that he needed to do it to, for the sake of enlightening the world. And if that's true, I think it's a wonderful thing because that's certainly where Dr. King was coming from. So, and the beauty is, and I'll just finish with this, if you take to the path of service, you're also developing yourself. If you practice healing, you must and you will develop psychic abilities of one kind or another. Uh, so although your motive is to help others, you'll develop. And as you develop, you'll be able to help others more. And as you help others more, so you'll develop more. And as you develop more, you'll help others more. So there is no, it's not either or, they come together. It's only if you just go either for your own development or you ignore spiritual consciousness and just purely focus on material service, which is needed, which is a wonderful thing, material service, if it's given freely. Uh, it's a wonder, an essential thing. But if you do both, 
if you give spiritual service, you'll develop as well, and you'll definitely develop the powers we're talking about. We've already seen that as people who start out with Reiki become psychic and all of it, they become healers. Yep. And you have just clarified why that happens. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Richard Lawrence. This is um, important for everyone watching and listening because everyone watching a show like this truly is here to assist in the shift in consciousness, the change in consciousness. We all raised our hands when we reincarnated to do it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching us. Thank you for your bright light. Thank you for the work that you do in, in developing your own skills and for sending spiritual energy to the earth and all of her beings. Richard Lawrence, namaste. Thank you, Lauren, very much indeed. We'll see you all and everyone on the webinar. Again, the link is for this right here on this webpage. Thanks again, everyone. Blessings and love. Blessings. Thank you for listening to this quantum conversation. And thank you for dancing with us to the cosmic heart. As we raise our own vibration, we raise the vibration of the planet. This show is dedicated to you and all awakening hearts as we are here to shine our bright light and amplify our love. Access all quantum conversations, special offers from our guests, and online healing retreats by visiting AcousticHealth.com. I'm Loren Gailey, and from my sacred heart to yours, I honor your magnificent love and light. We leave you now with music from the universe. Music literally created by the universe as musical notes were assigned to mathematical equations. The result is this beautiful music available at AcousticHealth.com. Namaste.